Hello and welcome to another episode of 30 Minutes with DailyStraits.com. Today we have a very special guest with us, Lauren Peet, an American entrepreneur who has been living in New Zealand since 2015. She is the founder and CEO of Multitudes, a workplace tool that provides manager insights to create happier, better performing teams by highlighting blind spots and providing them with the correct recommendations on how to improve workplace engagement. Despite still being in its infancy, the company, which has started in December 2019, has already brought in its first customers at last year and has raised 2.2 Australian dollars in seed capital from Blackbird Ventures with participations from renowned angel investors such as Alan Powell, the previous CEO of Reddit, and John Williams, co founder of Culture Amp. The company is now slated to launch its beta version and has gone from an old Kiwi user base to a global one. So today we're going to talk to Lauren about why she decided to start a business in New Zealand instead of her home country of the USA. Hello, Lauren. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us today. All right, let's dive right into the questions. So the first one is the obvious question. Why New Zealand instead of USA? Yeah, so the short version is for love. My husband's from New Zealand. Um, we met while we were both working out in the Middle East. And um, to, to add a bit to that, though, when we were leaving the Middle East, we thought we were going to move back to San Francisco. I'm from the States. I'd worked in San Francisco before. And um, but when we looked at the visa process, even though we were married, it was going to be far longer and far more expensive to get my husband into the US than it was to get me into New Zealand. And so that really was was the tipping point for why we came here initially. And then um, we've just loved it here. So we've stayed ever since then. Awesome. So could you tell us, um, you know, how the business came about multitude? Like, how did you get the idea? And um, tell me about you being an American and starting a business in New Zealand. What was that uh, like? Yeah, so I think um, just to start on the me being an American starting here, I think it helped that I had worked with some organizations, some other companies in New Zealand before starting. Um, I'd worked with a group called the Akina Foundation that supports social entrepreneurs, and I did some other consulting work. So I had a bit of a network here already, which helped. And then the beginning of Multitudes, my current business, actually starts with the previous business I ran. So before this, um, in 2017, I started a diversity, equity, and inclusion consulting business called Ally Skills NZ. And so we were working with lots of different tech companies um, in New Zealand, but also global companies working around the world, um, even companies like Automatic, for example, which is behind WordPress. And as I was working with all these tech companies, we first and foremost wanted to do a better job of measuring our impact. So we were doing consulting work, we were doing workshops, and we wanted to know, do we actually change things in the day-to-day? -day? Are things actually getting better in how people work together? And um, we tried all these different ways of measuring it, but we still weren't getting, we weren't getting the insights we wanted. And then as I talked to managers and agile coaches and HR leaders, I started to see that they had a similar problem too around um, for all that, that we try to pull in different metrics, really not having a great idea of what's happening for people in the day-to-day. So that was the problem. And then the key insight that led to Multitudes is that we're doing lots of activity in digital spaces now. So most of us, and, and, and this is a growing number, are collaborating on software tools. And so what that means is that there's all sorts of digital behaviors that we have that um, Multitudes uses to pull in automatically and get insights around how well the team's working together. So awesome play, uh, idea, especially now with COVID and everything. Yes. Just gelled very well so um okay um when you wanted to do the business right i just wanted to ask you as an american i know you are, you're married to a, a kiwi but what was there any um red tape uh, uh involved around starting one opening a company yeah so it is incredibly easy to start a company in new zealand and um, when they say it takes a day to get a company registered that is accurate i did it in a day um, the cost was was low as well. There's there's a nominal. I think it was you know maybe several dozen dollars in the order of maybe fifty to hundred just to get it set up, and that was it. 
Um, and I know from friends in the States that, for example, that it's a much longer process. Um, and I can also say that the, so the tax agency here is called the IRD. Um, and as an American overseas, I still have to file with the IRS in the US every year. And so I can say from a recent experience that it's also much easier to work with the tax system here than it is, for example, in the States. Awesome. So, okay, so that was done within a day. And then what did you do to start the business? Like basically, to get it going did you employ someone first or did you actually start um you know getting the better the the software um uh, started what what was the process like yeah so one thing that helped me was that um i was already running my consulting business and so the the very first version of multitudes was actually just a prototype that i ran um, with an organization i'd already worked with in my consulting business um, I, at the time I was thinking about analyzing Slack data. And so I went to them and said, Hey, I won't charge you any money, but you know, we've worked together before. I have an idea about some insights I could give you based on data you already have. Are you up for letting me try this? You know, we'll sign some, some non-disclosure agreements and all that to protect their data. And, um, so, so that was actually the very first version of it. And then it just evolved from there. So from that first prototype, I learned some things, um, I uh, started to work with a few different groups of people. Um, one of the first people we brought in as a contractor is someone uh, is a data scientist that I'd actually met at a machine learning boot camp that I'd been to because I was trying to develop my own machine learning skills and eventually realized um, it would be way faster if I brought in someone who already had those skills. Yeah. So yeah, it started to, to bring in some early contractors um, and then we just kept prototyping until we got to the version it is today. So you started paying them from your own pocket? Or yeah, you... yeah. <laughs> that was a painful period. I'll just be honest. Um, yeah, so basically I was working, 2020 was a long year uh, for everyone. Um, and for me, it was long in that I was working essentially three days a week in my consulting business and earning money there. And then three days a week, I was working on multitudes, not getting paid and paying other people to, to work on the business. Um, but that's actually part of why as soon as we could, we started charging people. So the very beginning of 2020, um, we had some people, basically the prototype we were at, we'd had a few companies that had said, yep, you know, this looks interesting, we'll pay you for this. And so, um, you know, it was, it was almost even before the point when I, it felt early to start charging, but I just knew that we had to. Um, yeah. So by but you were off work, right? You stopped working for people by then, right? You were doing. So I, for most of 2020, was still working these pretty miserable six day weeks and um, doing the consulting work, and then and then part time on multitudes. And it wasn't till um, I think August or September that I wrapped up all the other work and it just got to the point multitudes we were seeing some really good wins with our customers and i knew that for multitudes to grow i would need to spend more time on it and so it was a bit of a leap of faith i went to my other business alice goes and said um i wrapped up some work i also handed off some work to other people i was working with there and then kind of took the leap of of you know having some some a bit of income on multitudes but very little and then knowing that i was going to set out to try to raise our first round of investment Wow, that's great. So you actually completely went cold, cold. Yeah, I had no income. Um, I had no income. It was scary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, but uh, all right. So let me get this straight. Multitude is like a software that a company installs in their back end to check um, how employees are engaging with their, with their own company software. Like, you know, um, and it tracks which one works and which one is uh, doesn't work and which one employees lose use less of is that how it works it's close the, the shift i would do is that so we yes we integrate on the back end with the, the software tools that people already use um our key focus though we have a principle that don't don't ask for data from people unless you're going to give them value for it and so because we're getting data from teams the very first thing we want to do is then share those insights back with teams so they know to empower teams to take their own action to improve things so we're really about um like the insights but also coaching teams to to be the best teams they can be um so the insights we look at are things like uh for example the flow of the work which means how quickly is the work getting done um but we link that so that's more of kind of a team performance measure but we link that to what's happening in the day-to-day -day. so um we'll look at the amount of support that people are getting who's working really long hours and is at risk of burnout 
Um, and one example I can give is there's a team that we were working with where we got their data and we could see that one person was getting much less support on their work than anyone else was on the team. And so, you know, and that's not good for their development, but we can also see that that has flow on effects for impacting the work and how much work the team can get done and how well they get it done. And so that was, that was half of what we did. We showed that insight, but the second half was then to work with the team. And in this case, we were working with the manager to say, okay, what can you do to make sure that changes? You know, we, like, we don't want to just tell you there's a problem. We want to show you how to fix it. And so eventually, and you know, we, there was a few different actions um, that we recommended. The one that had the biggest impact was the manager actually going to other people on the team and saying, hey, you usually work with this person. I want you to be more proactive in giving them feedback on their work because they're not getting enough. And then what was great is we could see, um, we could see the uptick in the data and then we could start to see that flow on to the performance side of things too. So we're really giving managers and teams a tool to understand where they're at and then to experiment and try actions and, and to be able to see quickly, is it actually getting better or do I need to try something else? Okay, this is great for people who do remote work, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So what was amazing is we launched at the beginning of 2020 pre-COVID. And then with COVID, initially, I think everyone was worried, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, it's been, it, COVID has been a, a rough year. Um, but in terms of the uptick in remote work, this is a problem that we're well suited to solve. Yeah. So how did you get this idea? Was it uh, off somebody else's and you've improved it or is it? It was just, um, I'm someone who's, it, it was for me, it's sort of the short version. I mean, lots of people have shaped it and influenced it. And um, the core thing for me is that I've always been really interested in both people and data. So, you know, I've learned lots of languages. I've lived around the world. I think people are just really interesting. I, you know, I've studied behavioral economics and psychology that it, people are interesting. But then I also have always liked numbers. Um, for a while, I was looking at getting a PhD in economics. I went really deep in statistics. And so I, I think I was just someone that was always kind of looking for the links across the two. Um, and that probably is what helped me see that these people trends, we could actually get some interesting data about them. Awesome. So, OK, do, do you have any competitors? So what's interesting is right now, the, the closest competitors would be um, tools that are in the engineering effectiveness space or the engineering performance management space. Um, and that's because with our first integrations, we focused on tools that software developers use for a variety of reasons. We'll add integrations so that people on any type of team can use multitudes, but that's where we've started. And so the competitors are tools like um, a code climate or a jellyfish. Um, but where we're different from them is they're very, it's very, uh, they're very top down. So they'll give data to the CTO around what the teams are doing. Whereas for us, we're really focused on empowering the team. So what can we do to, what can we share with the teams or what tips can we give them so they can just do better work and, and so that they can figure out themselves that they don't need someone kind of coming in top down, telling them what to do. Awesome. All right. So this business, so um, as soon as you got the business idea running and then you got that one data, data software person to come in. Yeah. So uh, I've, I've checked your website. You've got now more than five or six. Uh, Seven. Actually, as of later this week, we have a new person joining. Oh, OK. So how how is it easy? Is it easy to find the relevant tech talent in New Zealand or do you need to outsource? Yeah, we it's been so easy. Um, and I I also want to say there's been all sorts of people just, you know, too many to name, but I do want to do a quick shout out to all the contractors and other people that have um, given me advice um, along the way. It's This has been really a product of, of lots of people. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, New Zealand has a thriving tech scene. And so we've been able to find the people that we needed. And, and um, it, you know, you can see from our website, we've been able to find a really diverse mix of people. Um, who are incredibly talented and, and good at what they do. So yeah, it's, um, I think that's just thanks to the thriving tech scene that New Zealand has now. Okay, so what about, um, you know, the fact that um, you've traveled quite a bit. I've seen you, your, your, your profile on LinkedIn, you've been to Gaza, <laughs> Saudi Arabia, and you've also worked with professionals in KL in Malaysia, where I'm from, before moving to New Zealand. So how does that um, experiences I, I, I gather that you're not a tech person at no, all. No, yeah, I'm a I'm a transplant into tech for sure. <laughs> so, um, I mean, you you had you have quite a, a diverse background. So you've you've even done work in uh, 
am I am I correct to say Morocco or you studied there? Yeah, Sorry. I had I was doing research in Morocco. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So how does all these experiences um, bring any value to multitudes? Yeah, I would not have been able to start multitudes without those experiences. That's the first thing I want to say. Um, it's seeing people, particularly the entrepreneurs, for example, that I met in Gaza or the West Bank or um, you know, women entrepreneurs I worked with in Saudi Arabia before women were allowed to drive there or the entrepreneurs that I met in, in KL. And it just, it, it gives me, uh, it's, it's just been so inspiring to work with those people. And it's been inspiring for a lot of reasons. One is there's, I think, in Silicon Valley, there can be a lot of hype. Um, and there are sometimes people who are just starting businesses to make money, which is fine. But with the entrepreneurs that I've worked with around the world, there's just been so much more heart to it. Um, there's, for example, the business that I worked quite a bit with in Jordan, I was there for a while. It was a, it's an e-commerce business for books. So you hear that and you're kind of like, oh, okay, yeah, cool. But the business was founded by someone um, Alat, who's from a Palestinian refugee background and his pathway to opportunity had been education. And he saw that there wasn't very much knowledge available in the Arabic language. And so it was his way of, yes, you know, starting a business, having an income, but also giving back to his, his community and kind of the broader region by making knowledge more accessible. And there's so many stories like that. Um, with the entrepreneurs that I've met around the world. Um, and so that that type of entrepreneurship, that's what lights me up. That's what excites me and gets me going. It's the entrepreneurship that it's about contributing. It's about making our communities better and and solving very real problems that, that have not been solved. Okay. So let's go back to the fact that you were, uh, do you know how to code? If, if it... I know a bit. Yeah. So I'm a self, I'm one of those self-taught people. I actually built that first version, the prototype on Slack that I mentioned, I coded it myself in R, very hacky, <laughs> um, but it worked. It did what it needed to. Uh, yeah. So sort of from this interest in data, I started taking some data science classes on the side. And what's great is with the online courses. So the MOOCs, the massive open online courses there's so much um like you know inexpensive or free information that's out there so i learned a bit of r a bit of python a bit of machine learning um and it's been really helpful to have at least some baseline understanding of what's happening on the code side i'm by no means the person that you want building your product uh but it does mean that i've got enough enough context that i can i hope you know talk a bit more um intelligently with our development team Oh, that's really good. So, okay, um, let's move on. So you've got the you got the, the idea. You got someone to help you build it, and then yeah. it's working. And um, and then you went and got two point two billion dollars. Yeah, <laughs> an Australian uh, venture, Blackbird, and and also you've been like um, been uh, backed by this investor, Alan Powell. Um, she's really big in America. So can you just tell me like how did that happen? Like the first thing that got your um, got your business going. Like how did you? Basically, it's not even easy to pitch to these people, no. but you got the pitch and you done and you got the money. So just tell us like how this uh, came about. Yeah, absolutely. So um, at the beginning, the first thing that really helped me was talking to other people I knew that had raised investment, watching all the videos that are out there on the tips and how to do it. And um, because I really, I'd, I'd worked in startups a bit in the Middle East. So I'd seen it a little bit, but I had no experience of raising investment myself before this. And so, um, yeah, there just was a lot of learning. And I think one of the things that really helped me at the beginning was a friend gave me this advice. Um, he said, start out with the pitch deck that you would like to have. So what's the story that you want to be able to tell? And then look at where you are now with the product and figure out, you know, what else is it that you need to learn or de-risk or prove to get to that story that you want to be able to tell? Um, so I actually started working on a pitch deck just for that reason, not because I was ready to pitch, but um, I started working on one a couple months before I actually even started pitching um, just to help me kind of frame up what we needed to focus on. And then, so that was really helpful. And then I just had lots and lots of conversations. Basically anyone who would meet with me, who would give me feedback, um, I, I was on calls all the time. Um, and for me, what really helped was going through my networks. I, I want to acknowledge I'm fortunate in that I lived and worked in San Francisco um, and I did my undergraduate degree at Stanford. So I had some connections to people kind of in 
the like for the US investors like Ellen Powell, I had connections um, in the States. Um, but yeah, I just kind of kept going through warm introduction after warm introduction and um, just focusing on kind of getting as much feedback as I could and then and then building those relationships with people. So what about Blackbird um, Ventures? Were they did they have a pitch party and you attended anything like that? Or was it phone calls as well? Yeah, so that one, it's really interesting. It started, I think I'd had a conversation. So um, one of their principals, Tip, um, Pyam Samboon, she and I had had a conversation earlier um, in the history, sort of when multitudes, I think it was like end of 2019. Um, and it was really high level. We weren't raising investment. And then Tip had set up an office hours that was, it, you could just sign up online. And I knew I was going to look at raising investment soon. So I signed up for her office hours to get some feedback. Um, and then interestingly, that kind of getting feedback, and by that point, I was ready to start raising, that then kicked off into the, the more formal investment raising process with them. So I, so I guess the takeaway is if there's sort of these free opportunities to meet investors, take them up on it. Take them up. Oh, so by then, when before meeting an investor, do you need a full-fledged product or half done is good enough? I love this question. So one of the things I was really clear on for us is that I wanted to bootstrap. So I wanted to self-fund for as long as possible because I knew that the further we got with the product, um, just the, the better things would be for us when we did go to raise investment. And so that is part of why I worked kind of those six hour days for so long in 2020, because I wanted, um, what I was really focused on is first getting a, a, an early version of the product out, um, which we did. And then I also wanted to make sure that we were seeing, we were seeing evidence that we were actually having an impact, a positive impact with our customers. Um, so I kind of, you know, I held on until we had both of those things and then we raised and certainly that's not the only way to do it. People do it plenty of other ways, but, I, but I can say at least from our round that having more of that traction really did help us have a better round, a better raise. So how many times did you get rejected before you got the 2.2 million? I love this. Great. So I ran the numbers a little while ago. I think I, um, I think I asked for a hundred conversations, maybe a bit more, but there were, you know, call it a hundred emails trying to chase up networks and connections and then spoke to 50 people. So about half of those came back. So that's, that's a type of rejection, right? Only half the people actually wanted to even talk to me. <laughs> and then out of the 50 people, we ended up with say, um, you know, about 10 that ended up investing. So, so that's 20%. So most said no, you know, 90% of that didn't end up investing in our organization, in our company. Um, and I'll just say for someone, I think a lot of people who become entrepreneurs are probably like me and that they're ambitious and they're used to getting a yes and doing well at things. And um, I have never been more rejected in my life. You know? And so it was a big, it was a big learning experience on kind of the emotional level as much as on an intellectual level. Yeah, so I wanted to ask you, how do you pick yourself up after being rejected? Yeah, for me, it's really about the community of support that I have around me. So my husband, who I mentioned earlier, um, has been a big part of this. Um, I always, we always joke that, um, you know, because we're married, he like technically by marriage, then you have shared assets. And we always joke that he has very much earned his share in, in the multitude's assets. Um, but beyond that, you know, friends and family, um, there's been plenty of times when, um, yeah, I've just needed to, to, you know, be sad and say, hey, yeah, I feel like this isn't going to work. There were, there were plenty of times I thought we would never raise the round. And actually, one thing I can share is literally the day that we got our first term sheet, so the first very serious offer, um, that morning, I just, for whatever reason, that day, I was like, nope, it's not going to happen. It won't work, you know, and then, and then it turned around later that day. Oh, okay. So tell us, um, do you have any tips for five minutes elevated pitches? Ah, um, so the, my favorite tips, I'm just going to pass on tips I got from other people, um, is to know your top three points. So to be really clear on what are the three things that if that's all they know about you, then, then that's enough. Um, so, and I actually wrote that out before I had any, any length of pitch, I would tell myself, okay, here are my top points. Um, so that's the first one. Um, and then the second one is really practicing the storytelling. And it's interesting, people kept saying this to me, but it wasn't really till closer to the end of our raise that I think it landed, um, that pitching is about telling a story. It's about, 
you know, it's not just the facts and figures. It's also showing kind of connecting with people on a human level and an emotional level about why this work really matters. Because as much as you want investors to get intellectually excited and, you know, market opportunity and all that stuff, you want them to just be personally really interested in seeing this business come to life. And I think the personal side, especially at the beginning, when you don't have much yet in the way of the facts and figures and, you know, the evidence, um, I think that personal side is especially important at the beginning. Okay, so um, New Zealand is constantly being named as the number one country in terms of ease of doing business. So um, we've established that because you said earlier you opened a company within a day. And um, okay, so maybe could you give us other examples like, you know, this will be easier in this will be almost impossible in the US, but so easy in New Zealand, like maybe is there anything that you want to tell us? Yeah, I think on that one, what I would say is, um, so New Zealand's only about 5 million people. And so the community is pretty small. And it also, I think people here are less, they're less bombarded with requests than people in the States too. And so um, anytime that we've needed advice on something, like we just, you know, we just want to get sort of a quick gut check on, are we going in the right direction or not? Um, one thing I've loved about New Zealand is how easy it is just to say, oh, that, that person knows a lot and either get an introduction to them because someone I know always will know that person or yeah. to just email them cold and have them say, yeah, sure. You know, you're someone else. Um, there's a lot of um, people in New Zealand really care about this startup ecosystem and helping it do well on a global stage. And so I found them to be quite generous with their time because of that. Awesome. So um, we just, for the record, you've never opened a business elsewhere, right? This is your first? No, yeah, just in New Zealand. Yeah. All right. So, okay. Um, like we, we were speaking before this, Americans are now very, very um, into New Zealand. They want to get, you know, over there as soon as possible for whatever reasons. Um, being an American living in New Zealand for the last five years, what kind of advice can you impart to them? Yeah, there's two things. So one is that... Um, the, come and work for a New Zealand tech company. New Zealand has a thriving startup scene. Um, you know, I mentioned we've just gone through a, a big round of hiring. We've just doubled our team. I know lots of other companies here that are hiring. And I think working for an organization, it worked well for me. You know, even though I started a company later, it was a great way, um, working for others was a great way to get the lay of the land, to start to build my own networks and then go on and found my own company. Um, so that, you know, come come work for us. There's some um, great companies out here. And then the second thing I would say is that Immigration New Zealand has a really clear website. And um, so they've got visa options for business owners, for entrepreneurs, um, and they're incredibly accessible. So when I was going through my visa process, I at times I would call them, I would email them. And um, unlike some other large systems around the world, um, Immigration New Zealand will actually get back to you. Awesome. So can you tell me, just uh, call, send a, an e a resume and then expect to get, will New Zealand companies reply? American? Oh, oh, that's a great question. I mean, yeah, like, you know, I would say if it's a thoughtful message, if someone has, has done the research on the company and how they work, if they've checked the careers page for open opportunities or what the company says they're looking for, um, you know, as long as it's as it's, I'll, I'll just say, having looked at a lot of resumes, it's clear when someone is just sending a lot of them out versus someone who is actually excited to work with this particular company has put the thought into it. And I think those ones absolutely do kind of cut through the noise. So do you hire Americans? We, um, so at the stage that we're at, we have people in New Zealand and Australia because of the time zone. So it's been easier. Um, but we do have, we actually, this person starting on, Friday is someone who's um, an American. He's actually been living in New Zealand for a while. Um, but yes, he is an American that we've hired. But he's based out here. Awesome. Because um, All right. So, okay. So I guess the last question would be um, with an American passport and if they've gone and called, you know, send a resume just like that, would they, what about work visas and everything like that? Oh, yeah. So um, there's, for work visas that also there's a clear process for it um and immigration new zealand spells it out quite clearly depending on the type of work kind of determines the pathway there there's a skill shortage list and so if it's work that's on that list then um it as you might imagine because those those jobs have been identified as important it's um it's a in some ways a smoother process um but yeah the work visa pieces is, is once there's a job offer i've found that it's you know not too hard to sort that out 
Awesome. Okay. And that's all the time that we have today. So we've just been speaking to Lauren P, the CEO and founder of Multitude. Thank you, Lauren, so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, June. No worries. The pleasure is all ours. So be sure to catch our next episode where we feature another awesome entrepreneur from across the Tasman. Thank you.